Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 36th Annual Queen's University Archives Lecture. Uh, at this time, I would like to call um, Ghana Shoni Janice Hill, um, recently appointed to the inaugural position of Associate Vice Principal Indigenous Initiatives and Reconciliation at Queen's, to please come forward. Sego, skuna goa se wagwego, wat kwanu horadu, kanu shuni yungyat, waganyatu, ni wagi darogo, nuk gundege tigidoro. Greetings and peace to all of you. Welcome. My name is Janice Hill, and I'm a member of the Turtle Clan of the Mohawk Nation, and I come from Tayendanega Mohawk Territory. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to offer greetings and thanksgiving to creation, as is my tradition. We've been instructed that prior to um, any business taking place where two or more people are gathered, that we're responsible to say the Ohandu Bariwadekwa, or the words that come before all others. <clears throat> to acknowledge and give thanks to all of creation and all that has been provided for us. At the beginning of time, we and all of creation were given original instructions. And we thank creation for continuing to fulfill their instructions and making it possible for us to live here today. As human beings, we are instructed to acknowledge and give thanks for this and so that all the energy of creation continues. So we offer our greetings and thanks to all the things on the earth. Agwego unska and did what wait nuni, ne ungwa nigura, dano de atinuarado, ne oguego yunki yenuase, jeet garunyade. And we offer our greetings and thanks to everything above the earth, in the skies, and in the heavens. Dano onagadi, agwego, de chidwanu horado, ne sungwa adison. And we offer our finest greetings and thanks to the creator of all things. Suk eto ne ona, what wagatari wun hodu. Eto ni odunhage ne ungwa nigura. Eto ni gawonage. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to this land which Queen's University stands on. As I understand it, this land is considered part of the dish with one spoon wampum, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Our peoples have hunted and lived on this land since the beginning of time. Our ancient stories tell of the birth of our peacemaker just west of here and the beginning of the Iroquois Confederacy. On behalf of my ancestors, our elders past and present, the warriors, men, women, and children, I welcome you to this land. Along with the Anishinaabe, I would like to also respectfully acknowledge the Métis people who also hunted and settled this land and continue to call it home, along with the many other indigenous peoples who now call Kingston home. <clears throat> I would also like to take this time to acknowledge this week as National Treaty Recognition Week and to thank the archives for bringing us this wonderful event today. Nyawagiwahi, thank you my friends for your patience and the opportunity to speak with you today. Nyawa. <laughs> Thank you, Janice. Well, it is indeed my pleasure to um, introduce uh, today's speaker, Murray Klippenstein, who, following a uh, Bachelor of Arts in Political Studies from this university in 1981, uh, Murray went on to the University of Toronto where he received his LLD and was subsequently called to the bar in 1987. Uh, Murray has practiced as a public interest organizational and litigation lawyer in Toronto for almost three decades, founding his own small law firm 20 years ago. Murray has represented clients and organizations in the fields of Indigenous law, environmental law, civil rights, affordable housing, international human rights, and other areas. Murray has for many years represented an Indigenous Cree Tribal Council in the far North James Bay area of Ontario in defending their Indigenous and treaty rights on issues arising from mining and forestry in their ancestral territory. 
Murray is also lead litigation counsel in a groundbreaking international human rights lawsuit against international Canadian mining company um, Hud Bay Minerals on behalf of a group of indigenous Mayan individuals in Guatemala for alleged gang rapes and murder at the Hud Bay uh, mine there. Murray is currently uh, co-lead litigation counsel on a class action for approximately 1,000 protesters and citizens who were detained by Toronto police in wrongful mass arrests during the 2010 G10, G10, sorry, G20 sorry, economic summit in Toronto. He's received many awards over the years for his human rights work from the labor union, indigenous, and academic sectors. He has twice been named by Canadian Lawyer Magazine in their annual survey at one of the top 25, as one of the top 25 most influential lawyers in Canada. Please join me in welcoming Murray, who will be speaking on Indigenous Stories from Queen's Archives, the Daniel McMartin Diary, and the original Oral Promises of Treaty 9. Murray? Thank you very much, uh, Paul, and uh, I also want to thank uh, his colleagues at the uh, archive, Heather Holm and Kathy Christmas, who've done so much to facilitate uh, this event. Um, I have gained a gigantic new appreciation of the archive here at Queen's over the years as a result of the diary that I'll be talking to you about today. and. Um, when I was a student at Queen's, I was more interested in other things than the archive. But uh, since then, and those of you who are students here now, as you journey through life, you will develop other interests. And I never expected when I was here how important the Queen's archives would come to be seen to me. But I, I do now see them as very important. Coming here uh, back to Queen's, um, it, it was a real pleasure, is a real pleasure, always has been a pleasure when I come back. And so those of you who are here in, as, as young students perhaps, or, or not young students, um, I'm an example of someone who looks back on my Queen's days with tremendous pleasure, so enjoy. Um, actually, coming into this building now, where I used to spend the odd hour or two, I looked across the street and I remember back then there were tall trees across the street here, and I remember a very tall tree right across the street here, and I remember the day when I came down to campus and it was engineering day or something, and at the top of the tree there was a large car right at the top of the tree, which the engineers had overnight placed up there. At the time, I thought it was pretty funny, but after going through law school and a legal career, and, <laughs> and this, this is what, this is what becoming a lawyer does to you. Now when I think of that, I say, oh my goodness, do you have a municipal tree permit to put that car up in the tree? Did you do an environmental assessment? And what about tort liability and negligence? And does the Engineering Society's insurance contract cover you if that, tree, if that car falls out? So it's not a fun memory anymore. It's, as a lawyer, I just think of these things. So anyway. Um, It's a funny thing that what I'm going to suggest to you, and I want you to think about uh, what, uh, what I say, and you may have some thoughts, and we'll have a time for questions, and I'm interested in how you interpret some of these things, because what we're talking about here is a very little book, and I don't have it in front of me here, but I have one something like it, um, and uh, it's just a little booklet like this, just a little paper booklet with some pages in it and some handwriting in it, in pencil. That's the book I'm talking about. It's very, very small. And yet, it seems to me, and I'm going to suggest to you, that it has enormous significance, especially this week, uh, Treaty Recognition Week. And so I want to look at this little book, the other one, symbolized by this one, from different angles, because I think it has potential significance from many different perspectives, how you look at it and how you look at what's in it. And <clears throat> The book, as you know, as you, as you may know, was a little pocketbook owned and carried by a gentleman named Daniel McMartin, who it turns out was one of the three government-appointed treaty negotiators 
in around 19, well, 1905 and 1906, as a lawyer, I'm used to saying, in or around 1905, you know, just, to, just to make sure I'm not, it was approximately 1905, 1906. Don't pin me down on that. Um, <clears throat> and part, I, I want to tell you what I thought when I first saw what was in this little book. Um, but I'll tell you first how I heard about it. Um, I've been fortunate enough to represent the Muskegua Council, uh, Tribal Council, around in the James Bay area for 30 years um, as a young lawyer, and it's one of the treasures of my life to have done so. Um, the, the things I've learned from them, uh, the stories I've heard, I've literally sat through thousands of hours of, list of meetings and, and friendship talks with uh, chiefs and elders and counselors and youth and it's a really treasured part of my life and um, in fact I came from their annual assembly yesterday and I have to go back tomorrow up north and uh, so we discussed a lot of issues yesterday um, you know they are unfortunately um, not provided with the health care for example, that we all uh, take for granted. And uh, I was saying to somebody, you know, I think yesterday I was thinking, you know, if, if, if I was a woman about to have a child in one of the communities there, it would not be something that I would look forward to in the same way that we in the urban south would, because the health care system does not serve them um, the way it serves us. Um, but I digress. Um, I was talking to yesterday the Grand Chief of Muskegon Council, uh, Jonathan Solomon, whose grandfather's X mark is on the treaty we're going to discuss today. And uh, he, he uh, Heather invited him today. He would, wasn't able to come partly because of the of the assembly, but it's quite something to talk to somebody, including talking about this book with him, to someone whose grandfather was at the treaty time, who talked to Duncan Campbell Scott, um, who heard Duncan Campbell Scott made some, make some promises. And for those of you who don't know, many of you will know, Duncan Campbell Scott was, uh, was one of the other three negotiators of Treaty 9, and uh, the lead negotiator representing the federal government. And he went, he has, this was a young man back in 1905, 1906, he went on to have a 30-year career in the uh, Indian Affairs Department and became the top official there. Um, and eventually he was the one in 1920 who suggested to Parliament that they create compulsory residential schools for Indigenous children to, um, in, in her, his words, uh, the Parliamentary Committee, uh, make sure that there was no Indian problem and he wanted to make sure there were no Indians anymore. Now he was the leader of the three group of, of commissioners and um, uh, after the trip, they, they made two trips, by canoe mainly, in northern Ontario to um, sign a treaty, to use the phrase, sign a treaty with the indigenous people there. And um, one of the interesting things about this little book and the diary of Mr. McMartin is it records what Mr. McMartin saw and heard day by day during these discussions. And I read this from time to time and I think about what he was watching and listening to in these events and listening to Duncan Campbell Scott say things about the treaty and about what it meant. And one of the things that I puzzle about, and I invite you to puzzle about, is what was in their minds when these events were happening. The treaty that they signed, and that's a phrase, is a parchment document, and uh, it was something the treaty commissioners took with them up north in their canoes. Um, pre-written in Ottawa in florid legalese English script 
which of course the Omashkigo couldn't read. And they took it with them and they got them to quote unquote sign the treaty, which often meant just putting an X by this line that was allocated for their name. And for a hundred years, the Omashkigo came to see that document as the treaty. They would call it the treaty. But after reading and studying Mr. McMartin's diary and the oral promises that were made, I suggested to them that that was not the treaty. I call it now a treaty document. It's not the treaty. What I suggest to them, and it makes sense to them, is the treaty was something else. The document was part of it, but the oral promises that were made on those days are the real treaty. And, well, let me go back. I said I would tell you how I first came across this, and I've digressed a bit. Um, I was doing a trial in Northern Ontario uh, for members of the uh, Meshkigwak Council related to the Shaplo Game Preserve, which is a part of the Meshkigwak Tribal Council uh, territory, because I'd got a call from the Grand Chief saying, we're going to have a ceremonial hunt uh, in the Game Preserve, and the Game Preserve is a Game Preserve. You're not allowed to hunt in the Game Preserve. It's a very large Game Preserve. They, they call it, their, the town calls it the largest Game Preserve in the world. It's a very big area. And they, uh, the province just declared it in the 1920s with no, for no consultation, never mind consent of the, of the Cree who were living there, and just um, annulled the, their hunting rights and trapping rights in that gigantic area just like that. And uh, contrary to the treaty, I, I, I suggest. And w I heard stories about uh, the families of some of the people there who relied on the, you know, the moose and the trapping and the game preserve in those days. And they continued to, and they had to defy the law to feed their children. And they told stories that one of them remembered his grandfather who used to go in the game preserve and hunt and trap. And then when the game wardens came, they would try and run. And one time he had to, it was in winter or late fall, uh, to escape the game wardens, he didn't have anywhere to go. So he headed out across the half frozen lake, knowing that the ice was very thin and it might not hold him. But at least if he got away, the game wardens wouldn't follow him across the lake. So he made it across the lake. But that's what they had to do to escape the law. Anyway, so they had a ceremonial hunt. They said, we're going to defy the law and assert our treaty, right? And uh, they did. Um, and the Grand Chief uh, he videoed it, and it was quite funny, actually. They, some of them went into the game preserve. They shot a few moose, and they trapped some mink. And they called the conservation officer. We've just shot some moose and trapped some mink. Come, come get us. So the CEOs showed up, and they didn't know what was going on, and the Grand Chief of Muskegua Council, he'd run this by me on the phone, a little speech he'd prepared, so he stood on the stump and read a speech to them, and then told them to arrest them, and they didn't want to arrest them because they <laughs> were worried, they didn't know what was going on, and they said, there's a moose over there, we just shot that, I shot that moose, charge me, <laughs> and they didn't want to. <laughs> they basically had to twist their arms to charge them, and, and eventually they did, and we knew we were going to take it to court, and we did, and then we had a trial, and, and uh, in Cochrane, um, and I represented them, and we, <clears throat> a part of our strategy was uh, to, um, to get the government, force the government to hire a history expert uh, to do the history of the, uh, of the game preserve. We couldn't afford a history, uh, a historian to do all that historical research. Uh, very expensive, but I thought we should go ahead because I knew what was going to be in that report, and sure enough, you know, Half a year later, when the report came out, it was what I, it said what I knew it said, and that was what I wanted to say. So we had a trial, and we, uh, I cross-examined the historical expert, and it took me about 20 minutes. I knew exactly what he was, what I was going to ask him, and because I, and afterwards, the prosecutor came over and shook my hand and said, that's a grade A cross-examination, and I just smiled. And then, as we sometimes do in this profession, we all went for lunch together. One of the nice things about the legal profession sometimes, occasionally, is, you know, there's a degree of humanity, if you want to call it that, um, and the opposite size. And we went for lunch in Cochrane, just a few blocks, and while talking there, I said to the expert, I said, 
You know, I've read everything about Treaty 9, everything that exists, but I noticed in one of your footnotes, you made a reference to a diary by Daniel McMartin, one of the negotiators, but that doesn't exist. What's going on here? He said, well, it was recently discovered in the archives, in, uh, uh, in Queen's archives. And I said, hmm. So we went and had lunch, and then I came back to my office, and I said, this is, this is interesting. So I contacted uh, the archives, and uh, my recollection is that I phoned them, and it, it may have been Heather that I spoke to, I don't remember, and I said, I hear there's these these, uh, this diary, can you send it? And he said, sure. And um, a little while later, I got a package in the mail, and um, a lovely little note, um, and uh, I sat down and read it, started reading, it was in handwriting, and I almost fell out of my chair uh, when I got to the parts about the treaty signing, because what it said was the opposite, in a way, of what the document said. Now, you have to understand that for 100 years, that document, the treaty document, I have a picture of it here. The pictures aren't very good. I'm very clumsy with these, but I'll show them in a minute. But the document was prepared by lawyers in Ottawa and sent to uh, sent out on the on the trip. And the three commissioner, the two commissioners, uh, when they got when they got back on the trip, filed reports with the uh, government said, oh, we interpreted the treaty to them and they understood and they were happy to sign it and yada, yada, yada. Um, one of the key parts of the treaty document is a part of it which says, you can continue to hunt and trap on your lands um, as before, um, so far so good, and then it said, and this is what we lawyers have called the taken up clause. It says, except for lands taken up for mining, forestry, settlement, and other purposes. Okay? I'm, some of you are smiling and chuckling. Exactly. So this is a huge promise with a huge exception. Now, and for a hundred years, the governments, federal, provincial, the lawyers, the corporations, you know, Ontario Hydro, everybody, said that if the province, because in the constitutional division of powers and the, the lands become the property of the province and so forth, crown lands, the province can, quote unquote, take up lands under that clause if it wants to for mining, forestry, settlement, whatever. And so the assumption for 100 years was that the indigenous people had no land rights other than you can hunt until we need it. Now, what this diary said was that we promised them that they could continue to hunt and fish and trap as before, period. And when I read that in this, in this diary the first time, I said, yeah, where's the rest of it? Well, it wasn't there. And I said, okay, he's just, you know, summarizing. So I went to the description of the next treaty signing thing. Same thing. And the same thing again. So I couldn't believe it. I said, this is one of the three government negotiators. He's saying, when you strip off that exception, that gigantic exception, you're left with an amazing promise, which is you can continue to hunt and trap and fish on your lands as before as you please. Period. And then what I saw in these different places, and I'll show you, is he says, you know, at New Post, or take what, what is now Take What um, Angus Wienus said, we accept 
your, the treaty as you have stated it. He said, as you've stated it? And then at Moose Factory, it says, Fred Mark says, we accept the terms of the treaty as you have stated them. I said, you know, this, this, is, this, is, this is too much because these, these folks were saying basically, I don't know what this piece of paper or parchment says, but what you just said, we agree to. And I couldn't believe it. I kept reading this and saying there must be something wrong, but it was a consistent story throughout. And I said, this is, the, this is one of the three government negotiators. I mean, and he's recording daily what he saw and heard. And if his written down, first person, contemporaneous evidence is accurate, then the promise they made orally is essentially the opposite of what that treaty document says, because the treaty document has that taken up clause, which is, as they say, so big you can drive a truck through it. And in fact, for 100 years, that taken up clause was the basis for endless development in Northern Ontario, mines, forestry, hydro dams. It was that taken up clause that said to the lawyers in Ottawa and, and, and Queen's Park, we can do this. So. When I said that, that this little diary has different you know, meanings from different points of view, that's me as a lawyer talking. And we all work in a society with many different systems at work and different aspects of it. And the legal system and the law is a particular part of that. And so, you know, most people, when they would read this diary, wouldn't notice what I just described to you because you have to put some pieces together. You have to realize how this contrasts with what's in this written document and how the lawyers and the corporate resource company managers see it. So, the diary, I think, was first discovered other than you know, um, then in the, uh, in the archive folks uh, by, as I understand it, I'm not sure about this, by a graduate student here at Queen's in the 1990s. Because I, I, when I eventually tried tracking this down, I found a footnote to it. But that person was uh, seeing it from a, I, I don't know, a sociological, anthropological point of view and didn't, didn't see it, it the way I've just described it to you. And, um, What I increasingly thought was that this changes everything for the Treaty 9 area. And the Treaty 9 area is something like half of Ontario. Could be a third, could be two thirds. Don't hold me to that. It's a lot of Ontario. And this is a story in this diary that is consistent throughout this, the Treaty signing area. As I went through the whole thing, and it's the same everywhere. And so I talked a lot with the folks uh, at Mashkigwak about this and, and to test it. And I said, you know, this actually fits with what you've been telling me all these years. You, you said the government would come in and give these permits for mines and would charge us for hunting on places, and, but that's not what the treaty says. That's not what our, the stories we heard say. And say, let's, they would say, let's take it to court. And I say, you, you know what? You don't, you don't have the evidence for the court system. And tactically, you know, not, not yet, not now. It's not, a, you're going to lose, frankly, based on the evidence that's out there. But when we studied the diary together, we said, that's it. We said, that fits with what we've been taught and heard. We can continue to hunt and trap. And by the way, the folks there do still hunt and trap. I mean, it's not the way it used to be, of course, but you know, they go out for moose, they have their uh, 
their uh, migratory bird hunting, their goose hunting season in fall and spring, take the kids out from school, leave the, take the time, you know, time off from work, go out in the land for the geese, shoot some geese for the, you know, for the winter. And their tradition is they can go anywhere on their traditional lands, you know, and do it. And the problem is, if you look at the taken up clause, you know, if the government wants to put an open pit mine somewhere or to clear cut the forest somewhere, well then you can't hunt and trap and fish there or put a dam up. You can't hunt and trap and fish there the way you used to. So the two don't fit together. And I said to them, you know, as I, let's set aside the legalities for now. But if this is an accurate description of what actually happened, then the government promised that they wouldn't do any of those things. They orally promised that they wouldn't do any of those things in your territory without your consent. Because they, they promised you could continue to hunt over there, so they can't put a mine there. It doesn't matter how many tens of billions of dollars of minerals there are. That's what they promised. That's the deal. A treaty is an agreement. It's promises. It's, a, it's, it, it's, it's, it's an agreement. The Supreme Court of Canada has said in a case called Morris that oral terms of a treaty are as binding as the written terms. So, yeah, and they said, I remember Grand Chief, I was saying to Janice just before we started that I remember a previous uh, Grand Chief, uh, Stan Luted, a wonderful man who unfortunately passed away from cancer recently. He said when he, when he heard the story of the diaries, he said, that's it. He says, now it makes sense. He says, my grandfather signed that treaty document. And I often wondered what my grandfather did when he seemed to sign a document which said they could take up all our lands. I, I used to doubt to myself, what I'm getting two stories here. What did my grandfather do? And now he says, now it makes sense. My grandfather did the right thing. He stood his ground and the three commissioners had to agree, had to make the promises which they knew were the only condition on which the treaty would be signed. He says, now I see my grandfather in a new way, the way I wanted to see him. And Grand Chief Jonathan Solomon says the same thing. My grandfather signed that document. And for both of them, they said Duncan Campbell Scott sat there and told us that we could continue to hunt and fish on our lands the way we always had, basically without limit forever. And then he took that piece of paper back to Ottawa and they said, we can take up your land anytime. And you can imagine how, you know, Grand Chief Ludet and Grand Chief Solomon feel when they hear this. And that that raises, again, some pretty question, big questions about this little book. You know, it's just some handwriting on it, in pencil. Well, what, what is the, you know, and for you, thinking, think about it in terms of, of looking back a hundred years, somebody wrote something on a piece of paper one day, one moment, it takes you a few moments to write this down. What does it mean? That was a hundred years, more than a hundred years ago. Well. From one point of view, it means a lot for the province of Ontario, for economic development in Ontario. It means a lot for you and your children about how we see things going forward in the, you know, the years and decades ahead. It means we have to think differently about what happened in the last hundred years. And, you know, one of the interesting things about this, and then it comes back to, you know, I, I talked to Paul and Heather about in the archives here, and it's, it just seems a little surreal that just a little booklet of paper in the, you know, was in the file somewhere and actually could mean that. I kind of doubt it to myself. I say, that can't be. I say, Murray, you're exaggerating. You always exaggerate. You're a lawyer. You exaggerate. So you're, you're, you know, you're overdoing it, aren't you? Um, so what we did actually uh, with the Muskegon folks is we, um, and I suggested to them a couple of things. I said, let's, uh, let's test this. 
So what we did is we presented, uh, we prepared a presentation and, um, and we, we said we're going to talk to people. We also, I also said, I think you have a viable lawsuit, and, and we ended up starting one, and it, I'll tell you more about that. But I said, you know, these things are very complicated. You know, the, the archives have a lot of material, and, you know, we, we don't, sometimes we're, I said to them, you may not believe this, but sometimes I'm wrong. So I said, let's test this. So we went on, uh, we, uh, we spoke about it. Uh, Grant, uh, Grand Chief flooded and, you know, people heard about this. We were invited to speak in Ottawa at the Indian Affairs Department to their land claims research department. We went there, and several of us, and we spoke to a room of 60 land, 50 or 60 land claims researchers. And, and um, we talked about this diary, and we talked about what we think it meant. And part of it, I said to the Grand Chief, you know, if, if th these are professionals working for the government on this. If there's a hole in our theory, that, you know, they're going to find it. No, nobody said anything. You know, they didn't say, oh, there's this other document, or yeah, I've read that, and it doesn't say what you're saying. You know, nobody came up with anything, which surprised me, given what the importance we were saying is. Same thing with lawyers. I was invited to talk to a group of um, provincial government lawyers um, about this, and it was a deliberate test, if you will, on my part to say, you know, if I'm wrong about something here, you know, we should find out about it. And so, you know, I went through the legal argument and the evidence uh, point of view and nothing. So when I say that, you know, these words in here are really, really important, I, I think I might be right about that. We actually started a lawsuit um, based on this, and, and uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a litigator. I've done a lot of cases over the years, some fairly large ones that, you know, I've sued premiers and I've sued, I've sued the premier, the head of the OPP, the provincial government, the federal government, and a bunch of other people all in one lawsuit at the same time. <laughs> and that's just one. And I know these things take not five years, not 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, when the stakes are that big. Um, you know, you, 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 whatever happens to, at the first trial in front of a judge, somebody's going to appeal. We lose, we appeal. You know, uh, uh, we win, they appeal. They go to the Court of Appeal. You end up at the Supreme Court of Canada. That takes you 10, 15 years to go through that. And enormous amounts of work and money. So there's one reason some of these land claims to, you know, took so long to come to fruition. The other wing, by the way, and this is I'm sidetracking, our friend Duncan Campbell Scott, back in the 20s, um, indigenous people were organizing politically about their treaty rights and they were sending delegations to Geneva and London, England and it was getting a little bit troublesome. So Duncan Campbell Scott amended the Indian Act, I think in 1927, to say it is illegal to raise funds to, um, to advocate for indigenous land claims. In other words, you can't pay lawyers. So, um, you know, cut, cut, cut off the legal process for the indigenous people. And then, uh, I forget, I knew all this, I forget the, uh, this is my excuse if I forget a detail. I say, Your Honor, I knew it all, just trust me. Uh, they, they amended the Indian Act um, to um, say that uh, Indians can't be lawyers without giving up your Indian status. Um, so there were lots of roadblocks put in place um, for bringing these claims. Anyway, we started a lawsuit. Uh, a lot of work, um, and uh, based on the diary, and uh, we needed a particular case. We found a, a mining company that was uh, had filed uh, uh, mining claims in a certain area for gold, just north of Timmins. We filed a claim, served it, and doggone it, the mining company gave us gave up its claims. <laughs> so we kind of like. Uh, I said to them, what, you know, what do you do when you're hunting and you're, you've got, you've got your, uh, a moose in your sights and he disappears? You've got nothing to shoot at anymore. Um, so that was kind of put on hold, but, um, and I think, it was, I think it's still a valid claim. But you know, we talked a lot about it, and I said, you know, there's more to this than just a legal claim. Don't think that the legal process is the answer to everything, because it sure isn't. Um, but you should tell this story about the diaries, I suggest. Um, tell it to 
you know, tell it to bureaucrats, tell it to corporate leaders, any chance you get, tell them about this. You know, teach it in your schools. And um, that's as important as a lawsuit. And you're, you're telling the truth. I mean, again, when you, uh, when you look at these diaries and you try and interpret them, and I invite you to think about for yourself what, what this means. Um, I was thinking about this over the years and thinking how to interpret this. You know, what was going through Daniel McMartin's mind when he wrote this down? You know, he didn't file a report with this in, the, in, the, uh, in Ottawa the way the, uh, the way the other two folks did. They wrote, they filed these kind of sanitized reports saying, yeah, we interpreted it and they, they understood. He went home and he took his diary and he put it, I guess, in his desk and there it sat. And I gather that the story uh, of how it got here is that when he passed away, his estate was taken up by a local uh, Kingston gentleman interested in these kinds of issues, um, uh, Havelock um, oh, Rob, Havelock Rob. And, uh, and then eventually, Mr. Rob donated his um, part of his holdings to the archive. And so um, it took a long time to surface. And I don't know what Mr. McMartin thought about what he was doing. And you know, I invite you to think about what, what was he thinking? Like, did he realize when he wrote this that he was undermining the whole treaty? Did he, did he know what he was doing? You know, part of me for a while said, and this, uh, this is an interesting thing about history and what do people, why do people do what they do and what, how do they see themselves? Did he, did he say, as he was watching this, saying, I can't believe what Duncan Campbell Scott just said. He just made a promise. That's the opposite of what's in that document. And I'm gonna write it down. And I'm gonna go home and not tell anybody. I'm gonna put this in my desk drawer and I don't know what to do. You know, think about it. What did, did he know? What, you know, did he say, uh, perhaps I'm going to put this in my desk drawer and it'll never see the light of day and what I saw will never be known? Is that what he thought? Did maybe, did he have an intention to say, I've got to talk to somebody about this and he never did? Did he actually, you know, go through some kind of crisis of conscience when he said what I'm writing down is the opposite of what Duncan Campbell Scott is telling, is injecting into the legal system for the next hundred years. You know, one thing that Duncan Campbell Scott thought was that the indigenous people would fade away, you know, that in a few decades, like the reserves would revert back to the crown because people were dying from illness and starvation and all this. So a lot of people thought in 50 years, this won't be an issue. Maybe, maybe McMartin said, you know, I'm, I don't know what to do, but it's going to—it's not my problem. Um, and then I thought of another interpretation, which is, you know, Daniel, Daniel McMartin was not like a lawyer or something. He was actually a miner by profession, and I don't know if he really understood what was going on. I—I um, uh, I, I thought about this some more recently, and you know, maybe he didn't. Maybe he didn't understand what the taking up clause meant. Maybe it's just the lawyers in Ottawa who put that in and said, you know, years from now we're going to use that in court, and they don't know now what's really going on. And maybe McMartin didn't realize. Maybe when he wrote down repeatedly that these promises were made and the exception was not put in there, maybe he didn't realize what he was doing. Maybe he didn't know that, you know, more than 100 years later, I'd be standing here, you know, talking about his little diary and that I think it's going to make a big difference. And, you know, what we have done at Mushtigua Council, if we said this repeatedly, I, uh, you know, in every meeting and, and when we write to the government uh, or we start the lawsuit, we say, um, you know, these oral promises um, that we can continue to use the land as we want to without limit in, in, uh, indefinitely, 
they trump, shouldn't use that word now, but they, <laughs> they trump the Mining Act, the Forestry Act, the Migratory Birds Act. Those acts are unconstitutional. We don't recognize them as valid to the extent they violate our promises. You know, we've said that repeatedly. We've said that in a lawsuit. And interestingly, I think it's made a difference. You know, you don't need to win a lawsuit to make a difference. Sometimes it helps. But over the last 10 years, there's been a gradual change in how things are perceived in the North. Um, a few months ago, we at Muskegon Council negotiated uh, with the province a resource revenue sharing agreement whereby, uh, for the first time ever, the province will take some of the tax and royalty money it receives from mining and forestry and turn it over to the First Nations, about 45%. It was just a start. Um, you know, as some of you know, the Supreme Court of Canada 10 or 15 years ago came up with the idea of consultation, and that's had a powerful impact, and that applies to the taken up clause. It's a bit of a limit to the taken up clause. But none of that is as powerful as the idea that, that I see in these, in these papers. And, um, you know, it's, it's a little mind-boggling. I read it, and, I, and I'm here today telling you that those were the promises that were made. And in our discussions uh, with the chiefs, at one point I said, you know, those oral promises, they happened at a moment in history. They were words that came out, words that were heard, assent was given, but it's not recorded the way a document was. I said, well, we should reenact that, you know? Let's re replay that, because I said, that happened in history, and here's an interesting, you know, series of questions about what history means, and I think, I may be naive, I did study history here at Queen's, so I can't be naive, but I, you know, I said to them, there was a day when, you know, Duncan Campbell Scott was over there at New Post, and the, the sun was shining, the leaves were fluttering in the breeze, and there was a dog running around, and the water was flowing, and words were said. And because of the way they were said, they are real, and they have a huge impact. I said, let's do a little play. So um, we decided to do that, and we actually arranged to have the diary brought to um, Moose Factory, and thanks to the Queen's Archives, the diary came, and we also uh, arranged for the uh, for Archives Canada to bring the original Treaty 9. So we had them side by side, and we had all the chiefs and elders being able to look at them. And um, we, uh, we did a little play. We wrote a script with John Long, who was one of the, he wrote some amazing stuff about the diaries early on, and you've probably seen his book on Treaty 9 and some of his, his original articles on them. Um, so we worked, we wrote a little script, and then we, uh, we invited the government lawyers to come. And um, uh, the film director, Alanis Obonson, heard, uh, heard about this and said, this is interesting. She sent a film crew, and goodness knows, she filmed this play, and if you've seen the film Trick or Treaty, uh, it's in there. And the Trick or Treaty was shown at TIFF a couple of years ago. It's about Idle No More, and it's about the treaty promises, and Grand Chief booted, and it was... Funny, because my colleague, Corey Wanless, I sent him to his factory to take part in this, and because I was in court that day, unfortunately. So he, he was going to be Duncan Campbell Scott. So he was going to be the villain. So he went into it. He went out and bought a period piece vest, and he even bought, I'll show you, he bought these glasses that Duncan Campbell Scott wore, these kinds of glasses. So Corey put them on and had a vest, and he dressed up like Duncan Campbell Scott, and then he made the promises there, and we actually got the provincial government lawyer uh, to play a chief. And of course, the provincial government lawyer's on the other side. He's got to argue that these aren't valid, but he was very good-natured about it, so he, he, he was, you know, receiving the promises in this little uh, skit. And um, so that was, in a way, I think, what those promises actually you know, what those moments actually meant. And so, as I said before, I, I think I suggest to you that this is going to affect and should affect, you know, the economy of Ontario in the decades ahead. There's, um, 
you know, gigantic mine proposed up north uh, called the Ring of Fire, which, you know, tens and tens of billions of likely mineral development there. You know, that can't proceed if these oral promises are a legally binding treaty, which they are, unless the government pulls one of the equivalent of a notwithstanding clause, which uh, the lawyers in you have, uh, among the group have, you know, understand. But, um, and I, I, th I told them, uh, uh, the, the chiefs, I said, you know, you hear a lot about consultation. Consultation means basically we listen to you and we take you into account, but you don't get to say no. It's not consent. I said, forget consultation. It's all about consent. Change the two or just change two letters. And consult becomes consent. And that's what it's all about. And I think that partly because of the diaries and many other things, um, there is a feeling that you, you, know, you can't just go into northern Ontario and do these things anymore. You have to have consent. You have to negotiate a beneficial bargain. Um, there's a, a big diamond mine near Attawapiskat. That was put in, it's closing down in a little while. That was put in there before we knew about the diaries. You know, it's not going to be that way now anymore. So, um, I was going to show you some pictures. Hum I'm, I'm way out of time. Let me, um, let me open it up to questions and while I fiddle with my pictures. So, I'm going to like, You'll ask a question, and I'll show you a slide, and you'll say, that's not answering my question. I'll say, oh, it's, but I happen to have this slide. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, do, do you want to? Um, okay. Let's see if I can get this here. If I was a, if I had this a little bit uh, smoother, I could just run through these. So th in Muskegon territory, this is the Moose River, uh, which flows into James Bay. It's uh, the, one of the major, major rivers there, and it's just uh, this is this is what it looks like. Uh, that's Muskegon territory. My friend uh, Doug Chichu takes a lot of photos. This is the typical canoe on one of the rivers there with the with the forests. Um, typical. Uh, forest, uh, snow, uh, sunset, that's Muskegon territory. And uh, <coughs> those are the lands that are at issue here. <coughs> Here's the uh, government's pre-written treaty document. That's what it looks like. Forgive me, I didn't, could have been a little more elegant with my presentation here. So this is the treaty document, which they used to call the treaty, and which I now call the treaty document. It's a James Bay Treaty Number 9. Here's a florid handwriting. It's written on parchment. And uh, as I say, we actually had the document um, uh, and, uh, in, uh, in Moose Factory. <coughs> Here's the... Uh, So this is the uh, government uh, commissioner's um, Treaty 9 travels and signing locations in 1905 and 1906. As you can see, the, um, the, uh, the blue dots are 1905, Osnaburg, Fort Hope, Martin Falls, and so on. And then the others are 1906. And you can see uh, how much of Ontario this treaty covers, and these promises cover. And that, at that point, they only went up to the Albany River because of historical jurisdictional reasons at that time, but the same applies later on further north. <coughs> so that's, uh, that's their travels. And here's a picture of the commissioners. And the three commissioners are seated. On the left is Samuel Stewart. In the middle is Daniel McMartin. And on the right is Duncan Campbell Scott. So Daniel McMartin, whose diaries these are, is sitting in the middle. Here's the taken up clause. 
written words of Treaty 9, what the signed document says about the government's taking up First Nation land. And His Majesty the King hereby agrees with the said Indians that they shall have the right to pursue, the, pursue their usual vocations of hunting, trapping, and fishing throughout the track surrendered. Oh, that's a promise, right? And look what I said. They shall have the right, the right, to pursue, the, pursue their usual vocations the way they always have throughout the track surrendered. And the word surrendered, refer, that's a whole other issue. I won't get into that now. But so they, they said, you know, you can continue. Don't worry. There. As it's subject to such regulations as may become, okay, that's, that's a separate issue. But then it says, saving and accepting such tracks as may be required or taken up from time to time for settlement, mining, lumbering, trading, or other purposes. So that's the taken up clause that has a dramatic effect for a hundred years. And you look at it, I don't know if you're, some of you are lawyers or budding lawyers, some of you are not. And it's hard to believe the impact that has, those words. But that's, as I said, the foundation for most of Northern Ontario development for the last hundred years, that taken up clause. Some other things as well, but that's key. <clears throat> and then, Here's what oral promises at the Treaty 9 negotiating meeting at New Post, now known as Take Watagamu, is a First Nation uh, member of Muskegua Council, August 21, 1905. And here's what the wording of the actual diaries looks like. And I've highlighted here these words. It says, as usual, the point on which the Indians desired in, uh, full information was as to the effect the treaty would have on their hunting and fishing rights. On being assured that these would not be taken from them, they expressed much pleasure and their willingness to sign the treaty. That's what Daniel McMartin saw and heard and wrote down. They were concerned about their hunting, but when they were reassured, they said, fine. That's the promise. Where's the taken up clause? And here's what here's what Daniel McMartin recorded about what the First Nation said. Uh, oh, this is another part of the same promise at New Post. They said they were also allowed, as of yore, to hunt and fish where they pleased. So that's what he said, he told them. They were also allowed, as of yore, to hunt and fish where they pleased. You can hunt and fish wherever you want, as of yore. I don't think they, you know, I don't think they said as of yore in a sort of Shakespearean way, but that's, that's you know, the way you used to. So Daniel McMartin, this is what he says right here. Also allowed. Again, now as a lawyer, and some of you may be lawyers, um, what's the evidence uh, in, in court? So how would this be treated? I won't get into it at all, but I mean, um, part of the problem with going to court is a lot of the technical rules, including the rules of evidence. And if we go to court, you know, I would have to prove that these were the diaries of the diary of Mr. McMartin. I would have to call, you know, the experts from the archives to describe how they came upon them and why they think these used to belong to Daniel McMartin and why they think in a court of law that Daniel McMartin wrote this. You know, it could have been anybody. So that would be an argument in front of court. Could be that the government say, we accept the authenticity and we accept that this is Daniel McMartin's diary. But as a litigator, I could spend days arguing about this and the government lawyers could cross-examine for days about this. So when you think about it, I'm telling you now that these are the Daniel McMartin diaries. He, that's what he wrote. And uh, he wrote down what he saw and heard. But if we went to court, there would be days of technical arguments about this that you wouldn't believe. So, I mean, if you're a lawyer, you could say, I don't believe you, Murray, what your, your theory doesn't, hasn't been proved yet, and you have a point. So, uh, but I'm, I'm showing this so you can also evaluate, you know, what, what you think of this. As I said, 
no one that I know of has come up with any plausible other alternative explanation. So this is at another location at Moose Factory. This is, this is what, according to Daniel Martin, um, they were promised. They should follow their custom of hunting where they sleep. Yes, they should follow their custom the way you have in the past. You can do what you've always been doing where you please, where you want. Now, when you just look at it, it says, okay, whatever, it doesn't seem. When you actually think about it and you compare it to the written, uh, the wordings of the, of the treaty document from the government, this is really momentous. And partly because it keeps coming up the same way time and time again. So, and here's a moose factory. This is what uh, Daniel McMartin uh, records. Fred Marsh, one of the First Nations leaders, replied that they had long been chanting treaty and that they concurred in how that had been said. So, this is the evidence, as I said, handwritten, contemporaneous, eyewitness testimony of one of the government negotiators of what the real treaty promises are. So, um, let me leave it at that for now, and, and uh, if you want to uh, invite some questions or some thoughts, what do you, what do you think of my theory? Huh? Heather. But Murray has very kindly agreed to take questions. Um, if anyone has any questions at this point, raise your hand. If not, I can. Oh, there we go, Sandy. <laughs> That's a very good question. The question is uh, that during these trips, uh, Duncan Campbell Scott was uh, writing about other things as well. He was actually a pretty well-respected poet at the time, pretty significant poet. So he was also writing poet poetry about, or based on what he was seeing on these trips. Have I got that more or less right? And um, some of the poems he wrote, when you read them now, are incredibly denigrating of indigenous people. And um, part of your question, I guess, is how does that fit into it? And uh, I remember a different lawsuit I did once. I put a poem in the statement of claim, but that's not usually done. <laughs> so it would, it's an interesting question about, uh, you know, how that part of Duncan Campbell Scott, and there's more to it, would come out in court. My feeling is I don't really deal with that at all because it's a little tangential. And um, you know, one of the things about courts is, and to court's credit, um, they try to focus on what they identify as the issue and what is the evidence related to that issue. And if you're not a lawyer and haven't been in court, um, it's quite uh, a bit alien uh, to see how judges or lawyers will focus on a particular issue. So if I tried to bring that into in a court context, it would actually be considered as, you know, not relevant if you want to call it that. But this, and this is why I said you can, you, you can read different things in the diary. Me, as a lawyer, I see it that way. This is what I would describe to the judge. Now there's a, another thing you mentioned that I, you may have in mind. After these trips, Duncan Campbell Scott wrote a long article in a U.S. magazine called Scribner, where he did, called the last of the Indian treaties, uh, where again he wrote about this trip as, as I suppose some kind of glamorous thing, 
And there's a paragraph, very, very, excuse me, very famous paragraph where he says, you know, what could they know about the maneuverings in the capital? What could they know about property law? So he was basically saying that we couldn't communicate, there was no communication. So it was a bit strange that he was afterwards saying that, you know, I got them to sign a paper, but they didn't understand what they were signing, you know. So that would be part of a, a, a legal uh, a proceeding, certainly. Um, but in terms of the poetry, um, I mean, your point is, is absolutely valid. I would just not put it in this context. Again, I'll sort of plead relevancy. I don't care. <laughs> you know, I'm a lawyer. I just focus on this. But I, I don't mean to to to, um, to say that's not a real a real issue. I, you know, there's a very excellent um, book on uh, Duncan Campbell Scott by Brian Tightly called A Narrow Vision. I, it's 20 or 30 years old. It's a really good book if you're interested. Um, and he talks about Duncan Campbell Scott as a person. He was a Victorian colonialist to the core. Um, and I don't think that that played a big role in his mentality. But I don't lay claim to it. I mean, do you think so? Yeah. Actually, I'm not even sure it's true. I mean, I, I didn't even pay much attention to that, frankly. Yeah, that's a very good question. The question is, uh, does this diary, as an example, um, lead to similar research or similar, dis similar, similar discoveries in other land claims and other treaties? And uh, the answer is partly yes, but uh, partly no. Um, this is, to some extent, quite unique. Um, there's been so much research historically into, you know, both archives and documents and also uh, interviewing elders and oral traditions. Um, this is quite unusual. As I said, and again, I, I put my lawyer filters on, this is, you know, the government negotiator in his own handwriting, writing what he saw and heard, like, that's a gold standard for evidence in a legal case. You don't, it doesn't get any better than that, frankly. Um, so I don't, I don't know of any other similar example. There's a couple of cases that have gone to court where there's sort of handwritten notes of meetings. Um, one in Quebec, I think, Captain Murray's hand notes. So that's similar, but it doesn't happen very often. What, the, what this does is, and you can think about it, I mean, if, like, what was Duncan Campbell Scott thinking and doing when he was there, you know? Like, I don't want to loosely throw about words like, you know, deliberate duplicity or fraud, you know. If you want to use those words, be my guest. <laughs> <laughs> because that's a legitimate question. Like, if, if, if McMartin was saying this is what was said, what was Duncan Campbell Scott doing? And what were the other treaty signings? And, you know, what happened in all the other treaties? So it does open up you know, at a very human level, on a personal level, what, what happened at these treaties? So, you know, for me, I, again, I said, this is, this is like half of Ontario we're talking about. And for me, it blows it all up. And in a sense, over the last few years, I've sort of gotten beyond that. Like, we started, when we started the lawsuit against the province, Part of what we said is let's have a treaty roundtable where we talk about solving issues. 
I mean, there's a, the litigator in me says, I want to go to court, I want to win, I want to win at the Court of Appeal, I want to win at the Supreme Court of Canada. Yeah, that'll take 15 years, but it's going to be great. But, you know, the other part of me says, like, there's actually some solutions to be worked on and some problems to be solved. So we started a treaty round table where we're talking about these things, you know, talking about education, talking about health. And um, repeatedly we talk about this, and I'm just sort of, d you know, dismissive. I say, like, you know, forget your treaty document. I don't even want to bother talking about it. We've got some problems to solve here, you know. So in a sense, hopefully, we've all gotten a little past this, you know. So... <clears throat> Yeah, the question is um, that um, I've focused a lot on the McMartin Diary, the written version of the white man about what happened. And how does that relate to indigenous ways of knowing and treaty making in the future? And you're quite right, I have very much focused on that. And that was my strategy from the beginning. And I actually said to people, um, I suggest we start a lawsuit based on this, you know. You've been telling me for decades that, you know, your elders told you this, and I believe you, but you know what? I'm going to say we go with the white man's handwriting for this particular purpose. So you can imagine me as their lawyer. When you're a lawyer and you have a client, your client has a right to fire you at any point for any reason. So you can imagine how I felt giving them that legal and strategic advice, you know. But you can also perhaps see why in our system this, this makes a certain degree of sense. And what this did, um, you know, as I said, it, and I said this to them, I said, what this shows is that, you know, your grandfathers and forefathers were very smart negotiators. You know, you've been told all your life that basically you folks who are outsmarted, if you want to call it that, or manipulated by these bureaucrats and these, and, you know, and I said, it wasn't that way. Even you look at these records, your forefather said, basically, why, why would we sign this thing? You know, like what? And the government people figured out that they were never going to get a signature unless they gave you what you wanted. And so they gave you what you, what the, you wanted. And here's the proof. So um, not only does it validate the stories you've been hearing from your grandfathers, but it makes them look pretty good in terms of the negotiation. You know, Duncan, Duncan Campbell Scott had to get a signature on those papers to go back to Ottawa and continue his career. So he basically said, let's get the signature. You know. But, I, you know, Grand Chief Jonathan Solomon and Grand Chief Ludit, I mean, they now have a much different and better you know, understanding of what their, what their ancestors did and what it was worth.
Thank you very much. And I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm seeing exactly what you're saying and um, don't, I don't have much to add to what you're saying. Um, uh, although two things occur to me. One, um, you know, many years ago, some of you may remember when um, Dudley George was uh, shot and killed at Ipperwash Provincial Park by an OPP sniper for defending a burial First Nation burial grounds in a treaty, treaty lands. And I was the lawyer for his estate and for the family for, for many years, and eventually we won a judicial inquiry. But uh, that, the Ipperwash Park was, was treaty lands, and that treaty was signed in 1827 as compared to 1905, 1906. And you talk about manipulation. Well, we colonialists weren't quite as good at it at that point. We hadn't figured out things like the taken up clause. So in that treaty, it says, you will have these reserves in perpetuity, like forever, and um, without any qualifications. And uh, so some of those early treaties have a little bit stronger language. But as you say, over time, the manipulation got a little more sophisticated. And that's why, you know, these diaries, to me, jumped out so much because it, because of what one guy wrote in his diary, it's just crystal clear what happened, I say. The other thing that I, you know, would toss out for your consideration, and I'm what, I wonder what you think, I mean, I, I think times have changed a little bit right now. Things are a little better right now. And you, you're, you're smiling and shaking your head, and then so I'm not surprised at that, but I just, I just sort of wonder if you, um, you know, if you would agree with me. I, I don't disagree with you about the manipulation in the past, but I just wonder if there's hope for the present and the future. Ah, you're nodding to that. <laughs> over here. The question was, uh, is there a strong case for treaty uh, renegotiation in the future? And in a way, I see this as doing that. Because as I said, I think actually, you know, taking the words that Daniel McMartin wrote in pencil in this paper and, you know, sitting in his tent about what he sauntered that day, um, renegotiates, if you want to call it that, the written document, parchment, um, and changes everything. And that's why I said, you know, consent. And um, so my clients, and my friends, and you know, I just say it's consent, end of story. And if, if you start from that baseline, as I said, then we're negotiating, we have a treaty round table, we talk about, you know, we want to redo the healthcare system in the north. We want to do the child welfare system. You know, everything, um, mining. As far as I'm concerned, none of that is actually legally valid. But then you come to an interesting point, which is, then what do you do? You know, if Muskegon Council wants to renegotiate, wants to design their own child welfare system, or family services system, how do you do? It's not actually easy. So if you want to renegotiate a treaty. Um, you know, what are you going to say in the treaty? Like, and you have various First Nations, various communities with different leaders, different chiefs, different... You can't assume they're all going to agree on everything because they don't. So, myself, you know, as legal counsel, I often want to suggest, okay, like, what are we going to do? Just assume you can do what you want or what you think is right. Just how are you going to do it? You know, I can, we can, you can... You know, how are you going to design a system of, of child welfare workers? Like, how, how are you going to manage it? Just assume you can do it. What are you going to do, you know? So when you, when you ask the question that way, it changes the question. It changes the issue. 
And so renegotiate a treaty? I mean, I don't, I don't even know if it's worth it. I mean, you could spend 10 years, 15 years trying to get, you know, consensus on the indigenous side, if you ever even get it. And so it's a, it's an, I tend to see it as an organic going forward process that includes ideals and visions on different issues and problem solving as you go and building organizations, building expertise, building relationships, you know. I shouldn't be saying that, I'm a lawyer. I'm supposed to put words on a piece of paper and say, there, we got it done. I'm saying the opposite. So, yeah. Okay, well, there might be a few more questions, but Murray's going to be here. There are snacks. Um, I want to say thanks to Jen and Nancy and to Kathy as well for helping to organize uh, this event uh, and everyone at the archives. Um, and to, you know, also give you a heads up, there is, a, this is just the beginning, there's a whole weekend of Indigenous knowledge uh, ahead of you. There is a, work, a symposium that's happening tomorrow night and Saturday, so check it out and uh, go to some of those events. Um, but yes, please join me very much in thanking Murray for coming and talking to us today. <laughs>